I think we all tend to believe that everywhere in the world is accessible if I just had the time, the money, or maybe both. But today, I'm gonna shatter that illusion and share with you a top three list of places you can't go, no matter how much time or money you may have. And for each of these locations, I'll share with you an instance of people going there anyways and what happened to them. Spoiler, it didn't end well. But before we get into today's top three list, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right place because that's all I do and I upload three, four, even five times every week. If that's of interest to you, please throw the like button into the devil's kettle in Minnesota and then subscribe to my channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of my weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's stories. is this tiny, lush, heavily forested, beautiful island 93 miles off the coast of Brazil that no matter how beautiful it looks, no one will go to this island. In fact, you're not allowed to go to it because the Brazilian Navy has forbid it. So the legend of this island really began in the early 1900s when a local fisherman was off the coast of the island and saw right on the edge of the forest were these beautiful banana trees with all these bananas that were ripe and ready to be picked. And he thought, I can easily pull my boat over to those rocks over there, hop out, grab some bananas and bring them home, no problem. That'll take me, you know, 10 minutes to do. And so he pulls over by himself to get these bananas. He anchors his boat, he walks up the beach, he climbs up the tree and he starts hacking down some bananas. And while he's up there, he suddenly feels a sharp pain on his rib cage and he falls out of the tree and he looks down and he's bleeding out of his rib cage because he can see it on his shirt, there's blood on his shirt. Was there a branch that jabbed me in the side? Like, what was that? And and he's alone, he's 93 miles from the mainland. And so in a panic, he ditches the bananas, he runs to his boat, gets it unanchored, and starts making his way back to the mainland. But on the trek back, he passes out in the boat. Later that day, another group of fishermen see this boat kind of drifting around near some rocks and it looks like something's wrong. So they make their way over to it and there's this fisherman who went to get the bananas, but he's lying on his back. He's clearly dead and he's in a pool of his own blood. 20 years after this incident, there was a lighthouse keeper that was assigned to work on this island and he brought his family with him. They were staying in the main house of the lighthouse and it was going fine for the first couple of days they were there. But at some point, captains of vessels that would drive past this island and relied on that lighthouse noticed that the light wasn't on. And so they reported it to the mainland and a search party was sent out to check on the lighthouse keeper and his family to make sure that they had all their supplies and that they were okay. When they get to the lighthouse, they find the entire family is dead in their bed. And the only clue they had were these puncture marks all over the bodies of these deceased lighthouse keepers and an open window. So what killed these people that went to this island? Technically they died from a poison that literally melts your organs within 60 minutes of coming in contact with it. But that poison comes from a very famous venomous snake called the Golden Lancehead Viper that only exists on this island. They exist nowhere else in the world. And so this island has been dubbed Snake Island. And since nobody goes to this island, the Lancehead Viper population has exploded. They are thriving on this island. In fact, researchers say that there's at least 3,000 of these venomous snakes that live on this island. And for every one square meter of the island, there is a snake, which means if you're on this island, you are always within one meter of something that can kill you. And these snakes aren't just on the ground either because their primary food source are birds. And so the snakes have begun to live in the trees and catch birds that land in the trees. Meaning if you happen to be walking on this densely forested island, you'd be surrounded almost 360 degrees by these wickedly venomous snakes that if you are bit, you have 60 minutes to get the antidote. If you don't, you're doomed 100% of the time. Nowadays, the only people that go to this island are the Navy, who replace the batteries in the lighthouse, which is now automated because it's too dangerous to be there. They go once a year to replace those batteries. Researchers occasionally go there, and you have poachers that go to try to catch some of these snakes because they're so rare, they can sell on the black market for 10 to 30,000 US dollars. But many of these poachers that manage to sneak onto the island just get bit by these vipers and die. So there you go, karma.
In early 1945, during World War II, the British decided they wanted to take back Ramree Island from the Japanese. Ramree Island is a fairly large, totally flat island off the coast of Burma that was a great staging location to fly air campaigns onto the mainland. So it was a great air base. And the British had actually owned this island, but the Japanese had taken it back from them in 1942. And so here they are in 1945, looking to take it back. So on January 21st, 1945, British and Indian infantry stormed the beaches of Ramri to try to take it back. As soon as they land, they have all this naval artillery support just bombing the crap out of this airbase, and it was just a matter of time before they overwhelmed the remaining Japanese. But the Japanese do not want to surrender, and instead they give up the airbase that they were on, so the British take that back, and the remaining thousand Japanese soldiers started retreating to the opposite end of the island, to where there was a much larger battalion of Japanese soldiers that they could meet up with. But the only issue with this particular retreat was they would have to go through 10 miles of mangrove swamp where there's poisonous spiders and insects and deep mud making it almost impossible to move but they're determined and they head off into the swamp but what the japanese were not ready for is what ramri island is famous for a creature that makes poisonous snakes and spiders and insects look like child's play and they were walking directly into its den the british troops decided we're not going to go chasing them into the swamp and instead what they did is they set up boats, blocking positions outside of the swamp. If any of the Japanese tried to escape, they would be there waiting. And so the only way the Japanese could get out of there would be to go to the absolute other end, 10 miles away where their Japanese counterparts were. So that night as the British are just kind of hanging out in their boats, staring at the swamp, they start hearing screams coming from inside of the swamp. And it's Japanese soldiers, then you hear gunfire and then silence. And then it would start all over again, all over this huge swamp it was just screams, gunfire, silence, screams, gunfire, silence. And the British are watching this like, do we have troops in there? What's going on in there? What was going on in there is defined by the Guinness Book of World Records as the largest massacre of humans caused by animals. And not just any animal, saltwater crocodiles. These massive man-eating crocodiles can weigh up to 1,000 kilograms or 2,200 pounds. They can grow to be seven meters in length or about 23 feet in length. And National Geographic has labeled these crocodiles as the most likely to eat a human of all animals. And Ramree Island has the largest population of saltwater crocodiles in the world. And they all lived inside of the swamp that the Japanese had gone into. A lot of them were bleeding from the battle they were in. And so they were literally alerting hundreds of saltwater crocodiles to their location. Saltwater crocodiles are notorious night hunters. So what probably happened is the Japanese got inside of this mangrove. The crocodiles were immediately aware of their presence, but they waited until nighttime before they started having a feeding frenzy. And over the course of the night, a number of Japanese soldiers had jumped out the sides of the swamp, exposing themselves to the British. And so about 20 of them were captured. And they said that they were completely surrounded by these crocodiles, that everywhere you looked, there were growling, huge crocodiles eating one person. And as soon as they were done, they would just charge after you and eat you. And at the end of their retreat, when the Japanese did get to the other side of the swamp, only 500 of the 1,000 made it out the other side. And so to this day, people stay far away from Ram Ria island because there are so many of these man-eating saltwater crocodiles that have no issue ripping you to shreds. On November 14th, 2018, John Chow hired two fishermen to take him out to this little island in the Indian Ocean. The fishermen were not excited about this, not only because it was illegal to take him out to the island, but because the last time some fishermen had gone to this island, they had both died. But the fishermen needed the money, and so they went with John, and they drove under the cover of darkness to this island, and they anchored a little ways offshore. The next morning when the sun came up, John asked the fishermen to take him in a little bit closer, but the fishermen refused. So John puts a kayak in the water and he begins paddling into this island. And as he gets close to the actual beach, 
he sees someone come out of the forest who has their face painted yellow and they're screeching at the top of their lungs. And John yells out that he's not threatening them. He just wants to come ashore and talk to them. And then a wave of people with yellow painted faces come charging out of the wood line and start firing arrows in his direction. So John, in a panic, turns around and paddles right back out to the fishing boat. Later that day, John tries to make another attempt at landing on this island and communicating with the people that live there. So he takes his kayak and he goes down a little bit farther away from where those people had emerged from the tree line earlier in the day and shot him with arrows. He figured he was a little bit farther out of arrow range this way. He lands his kayak, he gets out, and the same group of people come out farther down the beach where they had been before. They see John, they all start looking at each other and they start screeching and running down the beach towards John. John stands there until they come all the way up to him. They don't shoot him with arrows, but they take his kayak and they don't really know what to make of him. They're staring at him and they start speaking to each other in a language John doesn't understand. And then at some point, a child pulls his bow and arrow out and fires a bow directly at John and he was holding a Bible and he stopped the arrow with his Bible. And at that point, John is like, okay, I gotta go. And he jumps in the water and without a kayak has to swim a mile to get back to the fishing boat. The whole time, these people are firing arrows arbitrarily in his direction as he's swimming back out to the boat. And so the next day on November 16th, he told the fishermen he wanted them to drop him off and he would swim in and he wanted them to leave and be completely out of sight. The fishermen did not want to do this, but John reassured them that he was going to be just fine. He knew what he was doing. And so the fishermen drop him off and they leave. The next day when the fishermen come back to collect John, they see these people with painted yellow faces out on the beach dragging his body by a rope. No one knows exactly what happened to John, how they killed him. There's lots of speculation about how it went down, but it's too dangerous for anyone to go back and retrieve his body. And so his body remains at North Sentinel Island. The few hundred people that live on North Sentinel Island that were responsible for killing John Chow, they're referred to as the Sentinelese, and they are unbelievably primitive. They are completely cut off from the modern world. They live a hunter-gatherer lifestyle. They have no conception of agriculture. They haven't even discovered fire yet. They literally have to wait for lightning to strike and then run and collect the embers and try to keep the embers alive. Researchers believe that the Sentinelese are direct descendants from the earliest human ancestors that came out of Africa. And as much as we'd like to learn more about the Sentinelese, we probably won't because they aggressively resist outside contact. They won't even let the other similarly primitive neighboring island tribes to come on their island. The Sentinelese want only Sentinelese on that island. No one else can be there. If you're not a Sentinelese and you try to go to their island, they'll just kill you. So let me know what you think of these three crazy locations and let me know if you could go to any of these three locations, which one would it be and why? The best answer to that question will get pinned at the top of the comment section. If you enjoyed today's story and you haven't done this already, please throw the like button into the devil's kettle in Minnesota and then subscribe to this channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of my weekly uploads. If you have a story that you think I should cover on this channel, please submit it to our subreddit. It's linked in the description below. It's just called Mr. Ballin. I read it every day and if I intentionally use your submission, whether it's your personal story or just a suggested story, I will absolutely credit you. If you want to get in touch with me, you can direct message me on Instagram or on Twitter. My username on both those platforms is the same, John Ballin 416 I also post a ton of content on TikTok where my handle is Mr. Ballin. So whether I see you on Reddit, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, some combination, just know that I really appreciate your support. And until next time, guys, that's going to do it. See ya.